Heavenly Father, I pray that the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, would be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength, you are our redeemer, and we need to hear your word. It is life to our bones. Speak now for your servants are listening. Darkness. Darkness. It's the absence of light. Darkness. As in the plague of darkness that hung over Egypt, there is a darkness which may be felt. Darkness. In the Bible, it's often associated with evil as in the prince of darkness, or the works of darkness. The wicked are said to walk in darkness. Their reward will be to sit in darkness. Outer darkness is the term used for those who do not move through the gates of heaven. Is it any wonder that humans prefer the cover of darkness to do those things that they would rather people not see or know about? Darkness. <clears throat> there was a man. He used the cover of darkness to seek out Jesus. Was his intent to rob him? No. Was his intent to harm Jesus, to murder him, to assault him? Actually, he just wanted to talk. He wanted a conversation with Jesus. Was he going to try and bribe him? No. He wanted to tell Jesus that based on his observation or knowing of the water turned into wine miracle and that whole display in the temple of chasing the merchants out, that he thought that Jesus was a teacher from God. He wanted to tell him that. He wanted to say, Jesus, I think you're all right. But he came to Jesus at night. In the darkness. He was afraid of what others might think if they saw him. It could be embarrassing if others knew that he was meeting up with Jesus, this new controversial and radical prophet who performed miracles and, and had these radical displays in the temple. You know who we're talking about this morning? We're talking about a man named Nicodemus. Now Nicodemus was not your average person. Not at all. He was deeply devoted to God, make no mistake about it. He was a Pharisee. A Pharisee was someone who, was, who belonged to a religious sect that was a separatist party. They believed in external things as a measure of inner holiness. It was a rule-keeping group. If you kept the rules, you were holier than everyone else. Not only was Nicodemus a Pharisee, but he was a member of the ruling council. In other words, he sat on, he sat on the executive board. He was an uppity up. He was a big shot. His name means victor over the people. <laughs> That's how it felt. He was smarter than most. In order to be a Pharisee, you had to be. You had to be sharp. You had to know the Bible. Today, he would hold a PhD in divinity or theology, and he would probably be the leader of a religious organization like ours or the United Church of Canada, or the Canadian Presbyterian, or Presbyterian Church of Canada, whatever it's called, he might be on television. He might be one of these huge personas like Joel Olstein, or a radio one like Ravi Zechariah, Chuck Swindle. You're getting the picture. Nicodemus is a big wheel, and he did believe that a Messiah would come. But this Jesus 
didn't quite fit the bill, but no matter, Jesus has got his attention. There's things happening about this man. He's saying things that are atypical. Nicodemus is interested. And he wants to give Jesus his good um, housekeeping seal of approval, but he thinks better doing, uh, doing it in public. What would others think of me if they knew I was inquiring of Jesus? And so he seeks Jesus out in the night. He goes to him in the darkness. What do you think of that? John chapter 3, verse 1. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night. I've told you over and over again, there's nothing in the Bible by accident. Every word is intent, is intentional. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. That's Nicodemus. Now if you notice, Nicodemus is not asking Jesus a question. There's no inquiry there. He's making a statement. And this kind of comment leads to the expectation that Jesus will say to him, Oh, thank you, Nicodemus, for someone of your status to recognize and affirm me. I am so honored. But Jesus, who knows what's in people's hearts, does not engage in the stroking, I respect you to game. Jesus recognizes immediately that this religious PhD guy is lost. His religion has led him away from God rather than closer to God. I wonder how many cardinals, I wonder how many bishops, I wonder how many moderators or pastors or elders or church attenders are lost. I wonder if this could even be true in our church, that a person who attends, or persons who attend every Sunday, is lost. That is, their or our religious beliefs and practices have been distracting them from God rather than moving them closer. Religious people need Jesus too. What do you think? Because religion doesn't necessarily have anything to do with Jesus. Darkness. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. If you know in ancient times, take the Ten Commandments for example, God spoke out of the darkness. Nicodemus is in for a surprise. Jesus is about to speak to him out of the darkness with words that every single person, including those who sit in Sunday pews, need to hear. And these are the red letters of Jesus. These are the words that he said. This is what we've been exploring. It's a simple truth for complicated minds. John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, in other words, make no mistake about this. I'm underlining it. I'm highlighting it. I'm putting it in parentheses. It's bold. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Born again. The first time you were born, your mother's water birth, and you were born of water. But there's another birth, one that is of spirit. And regardless of how religious you are or have been, you cannot enter the kingdom of God, Jesus says to Nicodemus, unless you've had that experience of being born again. Now you know these are the red letters, these are not my words. You might acquaint the words born again with some hippie movement in the 70s or the 60s. Put it aside, let's chisel it back to the words that Jesus said. I had a woman sit in my office, not in this church, in a previous church that I pastored. She asked me, what does it take to become a Christian? I love that kind of question. 
I explained that she needed to be born again. It happens through a simple prayer of repentance, where you accept or receive God's forgiving love. That's it. She said to me, well, that's too simple. It has to be more complicated than that. And she left my office insisting that getting right with God had to be far more complicated. Jesus spoke directly to the intellect that Nicodemus was, and he told him that true religion was not about outward works, but it was first and simply about a new kind of birth. It wasn't complicated. You didn't need to have theological PIDs to, PhDs to get your mind wrapped around it. It was simple. It was simple. A complicated mind struggled with simple truths. I turn your attention to John chapter 3, verse 4 to 7. Nicodemus asked, How can someone be born when they are old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Doctor, can you be that stupid? How many of you have met someone that's a doctor that's not all that bright? <laughs> okay, don't think about your own physician. <laughs> Jesus answered, very truly I tell you. <laughs> very truly, make no mistake about it. <laughs> it's simple. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at me saying this. You must be born again. You should know this. Jesus is explaining that true spirituality is compared to birth. A moment where you emerge into a new place. This birth is not of the flesh. It's conceived and brought to term by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus introduces another metaphor to simplify it for smart events. He says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. It's like W.O. Mitchell who wrote, Who Has Seen the Wind? Do you remember that book? I love that book. Who has seen the wind? Nobody. But you can hear it. You can feel it. You can observe its effects. And so it is with the Holy Spirit. He does something within you. You may not be able to see it. But he's bringing you to a place of belief, confession, and you emerge as a new person. Theologians call it conversion. The apostles call it being saved. Jesus simply called it being born again. And there's this allusion to Ezekiel chapter 37. There's this beautiful, haunting picture of a valley of dry bones, all these skeletons. And the, and the wind, the spirit in the form of a wind goes over and these, these rickety bones assemble together and they become animated, become alive again. That's what Jesus meant when you were dead in the trespasses of sin, but you're made alive by the Spirit of God. So there's Nicodemus, with all his education and all his prominence, standing in the dark with Jesus, scratching his head. This brainiac cannot wrap his mind around the simplicity of Jesus' message. How can this be? Nicodemus asks. How can this be? I mean, in all fairness, in all fairness to Nicodemus, what do you do when you've been religious all your life and then you discover that the whole time you were missing the point? It's a hard pill to swallow. Now Jesus let Nicodemus walk away. He did. He knew that he was searching. After all, he came to him, albeit at night. Jesus knows that he needs time to absorb the simplicity of the gospel message. Maybe he will break free of religion and find a relationship with God, or maybe he won't. But Nicodemus walks away through the dark and returns to the very same life. But just before he does, Jesus has something more, more to say. It's like he plants a few seeds in Nicodemus' mind, his heart. And Nicodemus isn't going to be able to forget what Jesus says to him before he goes, because in the process of time, 
Nicodemus is going to see things that only make sense in view of what Jesus has said. He said to Nicodemus, no one has ever gone to heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. He would one day see Jesus rise. He said to Nicodemus, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. I'm sure Nicodemus was going, what are you talking about? But later on he would see the same Jesus hung upon a cross. And then he gives Nicodemus John 3.16. He was the first recipient of John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And he goes on to say that God did not come through his Son to condemn the world, that the world might be saved through him. He's giving Nicodemus some reasons to believe. But it's too early. Nicodemus slips back out through the night. And he leaves Nicodemus with a metaphor because he knows Nicodemus' motives and he knew, knows why he came to him at the night and so Jesus talks to him about the light. In verse 19, this is the verdict, light has come into the world but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that when they have... What they have done has been done in the sight of God. I think Nicodemus is getting the creeps here. He knows that he's come and saw Jesus out intentionally in the dark. And now Jesus is talking about doing things in secret, being exposed, and hey, you need to be in the light. But he walks away, having heard, I've got to be born again. I must be born of the Spirit. I must discover light. But he goes back into the Now, Oprah Winfrey, she hosts a show called Whatever Happened To. It's on her channel. Only Oprah gets her own channel. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever happened to Oprah, she got her own channel. Right. What she does is she finds once famous people, movie stars, television stars, music stars, and she meets up with them to see whatever came of them. Whatever happened to them? Well, I stumbled upon a story this week. This is incredible. George Wright. His life of crime started in 1962. He and a friend of his walked into Walter Patterson's gas station and they demanded money. Or not money. Money. Patterson refused. So they beat him up. They shook him down for $70. And then George's buddy shot Walter at point-blank range. After the robbery and the shooting, George and his friend went out for two cheeseburgers and played shuffleboard. They were caught. They were arrested, but in prison. Sentenced to 15 to 30 years. George's friend got more. But that was too long for this angry man, and so he broke out with a few other cons. They hotwired the warden's car as a means of escape, and they stayed under the radar until July 31st, 1972, 10 years. Then he hijacked a plane, heading from Detroit to Miami. He eventually escaped to Algeria. From there, he began a worldwide fugitive odyssey that took him from Germany to France, to Guinea, and finally Portugal. Along the way, George changed his name to George. Somewhere in the years between then and now, George became a different man. He asked God to forgive him. He says now of his criminal past, it's gone. God has forgiven me. Of course, the law says otherwise. But George married, had children, joined a church, got baptized all in Portugal. He turned from crime. He worked with his hands to provide for his family. He did a lot of social work. He cleaned graffiti off the walls in Lisbon. He helped to renovate and outreach a center for HIV positive children. He served dinners for the homeless people. He planted public flower gardens. 
He raised two healthy and happy kids. He grew into a senior citizen. And after 40 years of hiding, he didn't have one crime or mark on his, his record, not even a parking violation. September 26, 2011, the law caught up with him. We know you call yourself George, but we know you're George. They found George Wright, and they arrested him. Portugal denied the United States attempt to have George extradited, but during the hearings, the central issue was not whether they arrested the right person. The controversy was whether they arrested the same person. Can a person actually change? Whatever happened to Nicodemus? The teachings and miracles of Jesus were gathering a lot of attention in the public, and the religious leaders, the Pharisees, were threatened by him. We know that Jesus is the great polarizer. You're either like, like iron filings, and Jesus the magnet, you're either drawn to him or repelled by him. When the Pharisees heard that that Jesus was being talked about in the context of being the Messiah. They sent temple guards to arrest him, but even the guards didn't want to because they thought, ah, this guy, there's something different about him. I don't think we want to get our hands dirty there. And so they were talking amongst themselves, the Pharisees, and a man by the name of Nicodemus spoke up and he said, does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he's been doing? What we find out here is that Nicodemus respects Jesus. He respects him. So, there's a lot of people that respect Jesus. But there's more. Remember the words of Jesus about being lifted up? Nicodemus saw that happen to Jesus. He saw him being crucified. He saw him die. And a colleague, an associate of his by the name of Joseph from Arimathea, he found out, secretly approached Pilate and asked if he could have the body and relocate it into his own tomb. And the Bible says in John 19.39 that Joseph of Arimathea was assisted by somebody. Do you know who it was? Nicodemus. The man who visited Jesus by night steps out into the light. Not only does he cooperate with Joseph, but he brings a mixture of myrrh and aloe, 75 pounds. This is a lot of money. And together they wrap Jesus' body with the spices and straps of linen. Nicodemus is no longer seeking Jesus in the dark, but now he's identified with him in the light. Do you think Nicodemus has seen the light? Do you think he has seen what dead religion can do? Do you think he's confessed his sins to the Lord and his new religion is now about a relationship with God? Do you think Nicodemus has been moved by the Holy Spirit? Do you think Nicodemus has been born again? But forget about him. What about you? Because that's what it's about. Heavenly Father, We all have history. For some of us, our history is that we grew up with a mom and dad who took us to Sunday school. Some of our parents talked about Jesus, some of us didn't. Some of us have been part of a church and we've sat there. Some of us bored to tears, some of us interested. 
some of us along the way realize there's more. It's not about religion, it's about relationship. It's about emerging as a new person because you have forgiven us. It's about being born again. Something only the Holy Spirit can do. May you bring each person who's gathered here today to that place where we say, God, we accept your forgiving love. May we be born anew, not of flesh, but of your spirit.